K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. The leader in talk radio on the Internet, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. To get up to like $68,000, my heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Tax Shield A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than ten thousand dollars to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose. U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Call eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. 800-471-3287. We believe in the American way, and we built this country called the USA, and we fly our flag because we're proud and free, we're Americans. Red, white, blue is our way of life, we never back down from a challenge or a fight, nature provides, God gives the rights, we're Americans. The waters and we hunt the lands. We force the steel with our own two hands. With what we've got, we do the best we can. We're Americans. You are now tuned in to the Conservative Commudgeon Radio Show, right here on the all new K98 Talk. Good Wednesday evening, everybody. It is your favorite grouch. The conservative curmudgeon and welcome to the g nation now we had a little change in the lineup tonight so you didn't get to hear america off the rails with the uh rowdy rowdy one rick robinson uh there was a good reason for that folks uh the man is busier than the proverbial one-legged man in a butt kicking contest uh scraping and scrimping and, and wheeling and dealing to put this station even better on the map but you will get, according to me, with Jason DeWilkins following my show tonight in an hour. So do stay tuned for that. And make sure you tune in tomorrow night for Red Nation Rising, followed by Game On with J.D. and Stacy right here on K98 Talk. Now, I got to tell you, I, I have really been disturbed uh, with this whole Greece deal going on, uh, especially in light of what I've brought out last week about Puerto Rico about to default on their debt, uh, being that they're an American protectorate 
Uh, guess who's going to be bailing them out? Yeah, that's right. You and me. So anyway, uh, this has really been troubling to me. And I, and I came across this article even after uh, last week's show. And uh, it's not the hot, sexy story of the moment. I get that. But folks, I promise you, this is important or I wouldn't be bringing it up to begin with. So here's what we got. We got the Congressional Budget Office Director, Mr. Keith Hall, who was testifying to the U.S. Senate, and he warned that publicly held debt of the U.S. government, when measured as a percentage of our gross domestic product, is headed toward a level that the United States has only seen once in its history, and that was at the very end of World War II. Now, Mr. Hall said that to simply contain the debt at the high historical level where it currently sits, which is 74% of our GDP, would require either significant in increases in federal revenue or decreases in non-interest federal spending or a combination of the two. Historically, our governmental debt held by the public, measured as a percentage of GDP, hit its peak in 1945 and 46, when it was 104% and 106% of GDP, respectively. Now, in 2015, the CBO estimates, that's the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office for those scoring at home, estimates that the United States government debt held by the public will be 74% of the GDP. That is higher than the 69% of GDP debt the U.S. government had in 1943, the second year after Pearl Harbor. By 2039, the CBO projects the debt held by the public will increase to 101% of our GDP, and by 2040, to 103%. At that point, Hall told the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee the debt would still be on an upward path relative to the size of the economy. Folks, does any of this sound familiar? Uh, if you've read anything about Greece and them defaulting on their debt and being bailed out and now being bailed out again, this is exactly where we're heading. And for them to sit here and say it's going to happen in 2040, that's scary enough. But the CBO has time and again shown that they always underestimate the amount of time it takes to ramp up our debt. So I'm guessing we can shorten this by about 10 to 15 years. Now, the United States Treasury divides the federal debt into two main parts. There's debt held by the public, and there's intragovernmental debt. Now, the debt held by the public includes treasury securities, such as T-bills, T-notes, and bonds that are owned by individuals, domestic and foreign corporations, private banks, the Federal Reserve Bank, and foreign governments. The Treasury pays interest on this debt to those who own it. The intragovernmental debt is money the Treasury owes to government trust funds, such as the Social Security Trust Fund. Because the government has spent money belonging to those trust funds, like Social Security and payroll taxes, on other things uh, than what the trust fund was created for. Isn't that special? As of July 9th, according to the Treasury, the debt held by the public, by the public, was dollars $13,102,609,587,775.14. And the intragovernmental debt 
was five billion forty nine million. I'm sorry, five trillion forty nine billion three hundred twenty one million six hundred ninety six thousand seven hundred twenty dollars and eighty seven cents. That equals a total debt of eighteen point one five one trillion dollars. I'm not going all the way down there again. While the run-up in debt held by the public as a percentage of GDP in the 40s financed a global war against Nazi Germany and Japan that ended with the victory for the Allied forces, the current run towards unprecedented debt is based on projected increases in mandatory federal spending for entitlement programs. Are you getting that? I'm going to say it again. The current run toward unprecedented debt in, is based on projected increases in mandatory federal spending for entitlement programs. These include Medicare, Medicaid, and Obamacare subsidies. Mainly because of the aging population and rising health care costs, the extended baseline projections show revenues that fall well short of spending over the long term, producing a substantial imbalance in the federal budget. And this is all according to Mr. Hall in his sworn testimony to the Senate. As a result, budget deficits are projected to rise steadily and by 2040 to raise federal debt held by the public to a percentage of GDP seen at only one previous time in United States history, the final year of World War II and the following year. Moreover, he said, the debt would still be on an upward path relative to the size of our economy. Consequently, the policy changes needed to reduce debt to any given amount would become larger and larger over time. The rising debt could not be sustained indefinitely. The government's creditors would eventually begin to doubt its ability to cut spending or raise revenues by enough to pay its debt obligations, forcing the government to pay a much higher interest rate to borrow money. Now, folks, you want to talk about fundamental change? The traitor-in-chief, Barack Obama, is causing this. He is causing this. Did Bush run up debt? Yes, Bush ran up debt. Did Bush run up the kind of debt Obama's running up? Not even close. Eventually, the nation will face a crisis. But with wary investors demanding much higher interest rates to buy U.S. government debt, how long the nation could sustain such growth in federal debt is impossible to predict with any confidence, testified Hall. At some point, investors will begin to doubt the government's willingness or ability to meet its debt obligations, requiring it to pay much higher interest costs in order to continue borrowing money. Such a fiscal crisis would present policymakers with extremely difficult choices and would probably have a substantial negative impact on the country. You think? Unfortunately, there is no way to predict confidently whether or when such a fiscal crisis might occur in the United States. Hey, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. We're closer than most people want to admit or realize. In particular, though, as the debt to GDP ratio rises, there's no in um, uh, the, there's no definable point indicating that a crisis is likely or imminent. But all else being equal, the larger a government's debt, the greater the risk of a fiscal crisis. Simply keeping the debt in check would require significant changes in federal policy that would hit Americans in the pocketbook. Youngsters, millennials, listen up. This is really going to affect you as you move forward into your working careers. 
it's going to affect those of us in my age bracket that are, uh, let's say we're not near retirement, but we're not far either. So just holding the federal debt at its current high level of 74% of the GDP in 2040, that's holding it from where it is right now to the same level in uh, what, uh, 30, 30 years, was it, uh, 25 years would require significant changes in tax and spending policies. The combinations of increases in federal tax revenues and cuts in non-interest federal spending relative to current law of about 1.1% of GDP in each year for 25 years would be needed. You getting that? That's a cut of 1.1% of federal spending relative to current law each year for the next 25 years. That's just to hold the level at the percentage that it's at. In 2016, this would be a spending and or tax revenue increase totaling about $210 billion. And then more than that in each year after that. It doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking about our nation's finances, but folks, it's growing exponentially. And it's not being controlled. And nobody's willing to step forward and actually control it. I hear great ideas about flat taxes and simplifying the tax code. And those are great ideas. But let me tell you something. We have got to get somebody that will get in office and cut the damn spending. Now, if these changes came from increases of equal percentage in all types of revenues, they would represent an increase of 6% relative to current law for each year between 2016 and 2040. For example, an average middle income household would have to pay $750 more in taxes and more than that in each year afterwards. Or if the changes came from cuts of equal percentage in all types of non-interest spending, that spending each year would have to be 5.5% less than projected. Are you starting to see the pain? Folks, this is going to hurt. Even if we start now, it's going to hurt. If the reduction was applied across the board to all types of non-interest spending, an average 65-year-old in the middle of the earnings income who retires in 2016 would see a reduction of about $1,050 in his or her initial annual Social Security benefits, and then more than that in each year afterwards. The more ambitious goal of returning public debt by 2040 to its average level over the past half century, which is 38% of our GDP, would require more than that. This would require a revenue increase and or non-interest spending decreases totaling 2.6% of the GDP every single year for the next 25 years. This means an average middle income household would have to pay $1,700 more in federal taxes in 2016 and then larger amounts in the subsequent years. Or by cutting interest spending or non-interest spending across the board, average Social Security benefits for that 65-year-old in the middle of all earning brackets would have to drop by $2,400 in 2016 and larger amounts after that. So, what is the White House's idea that they keep pushing? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, Joe Biden's idea. 
and, and Biden's quote, the only solution is to spend our way out of debt. Just keep spending, Joe. Keynesian economics only fails when you don't spend enough, right? And that is the failure of every great socialist economy is it's not spending enough, right? If we only spend more, we can fix this sinking ship, right, Joe? Right, Barack? You guys are ass clowns in D.C. And you know what? Reince Priebus and the GOP, you're right behind them because you're singing the same song. You might be wa walking on the sidewalk across the street, but you're walking in the same direction to the same destination. We have to fix this. And we have to fix it now. All right. That's enough of the boring economics part. Um, I'm hoping in the next week or two, uh, I, I've been chatting uh, with a man that you probably know. Uh, we're going to be bringing uh, Jonathan Honig from Fox Business News onto the program uh, to discuss our nation's finances a little more in detail. And Jonathan is going to uh, most assuredly be dropping some financial bombs that uh, I don't even do enough research to figure out because he is the man. In the interim, if you would like to learn more about Jonathan, I'm sure you're familiar with his appearances on uh, Cash and In on, on Fox on Saturdays with Eric Bowling. But uh, you can visit Jonathan's website in the interim to his appearance on the show, and that is capitalistpig.com. Uh, Jonathan has a great sense of humor and a great financial insight, and I'm looking very forward to having Jonathan on the program in the coming weeks. So with that being said, we're going to press on, and you may have noticed uh, a tweet that I posted the other day about how police blotters time and again are proving that Trump's comments weren't racist comments. They were actually factually correct. Well, CNS dropped a report on July 2nd that uh, showed that the most recent data from U.S. Customs and Border Protection showed that a large number of unaccompanied alien children are continuing to show up illegally and cross the border and that number, well, we don't know what the number is, but the average number that were apprehended per day in the month of June was 127. That is 127 unaccompanied illegal alien children, minors, crossing the border into the United States every day for the month of June. That's just what they caught. The latest apprehension report from Customs and Border Control, Bus Customs and Border Patrol, excuse me, shows that 26,685 unaccompanied minors have been apprehended at the southwest U.S. border so far in fiscal year 2015 which began on October 1st. Of those, all but 409 were from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico. By the end of May, the total number of apprehended UACs was 22,869, meaning another 3,816 children were caught after crossing the border during the month of June. The average uh, averaged across the 30 days of June, that is 127 children per day crossing our border illegally so that Obama can grant them citizenship in his ultimate plan and then bring their families across to grant them citizenship and place a further tax burden on you and I who bust our asses to try to scrape by and make the American dream a possibility. Folks, he is fundamentally changing America, and it's not for the better. I suggest that we wake the hell up. 
I'm sick of complaining about Obama. He's not going to be impeached. Okay, he's done enough to be impeached, I have no doubt, but he's not going to be impeached. So what we need is we need our elected GOP officials, the people that we put the majority in the House and Senate so that they could stand up for us and stop these illegal and rampantly progressive policies, and they're failing us. Folks, they are failing us. I'm tired of complaining about Obama. I want to be able to concentrate more on stopping the Democrats from winning the White House. And I want to be able to concentrate more, like John Bolton is, on helping the Republicans keep the Senate, too. We can't do that if we're sitting around complaining about Obama because he's still getting his way, because our damn elected officials won't do anything to stop him. Light their switchboards on fire. Melt the lines. They need to be held to the fire. The same fire that they were screaming about when they were running to get elected. We need to hold that fire to their feet and make them answer to us, the constituents. Now we're getting ready to take a break and we'll be back with the second half of the show in about two or three minutes. Hey, you know, give or take, I don't know how many commercials we're going to run, but you're going to enjoy them anyway. So stay tuned. You got a half more hour with the Grouch and then it's According to Me with Jason DeWilkins on the trifecta of conservative talk radio on K98 Talk. Thank you for being here. Oh, but ain't that America? You and me. Ain't that America? Something to see, baby. Ain't that America? Home of the free, yeah. We will never fully understand what we've asked of our military service members or their families, asking them to put themselves in harm's way to endure it all. But we do understand that it's our turn, our duty, to keep them secure for the rest of their lives. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs help our most severely ill or injured veterans live independently, at no cost, for life, so that they might stand at ease. Join us at findwwp.org. Red Nation Rising brings you Town Hall Radio. From a single tweet to three million a month, our community is a force to be reckoned with on social media. So don't miss our show Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern on K98 Talk. Our chat room is our co-host and you ask the question. Join us and be heard. So get ready to sound off on Red Nation Rising Radio. No one else is going to do it for you. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. back uh it is time to uh cover the kids ears uh lock up the pets uh i might get a little surly here um 
struggling for relevance and something that bears a self-importance to them and nobody but them, MTV plans to air a documentary about what it means to be young and white. Now, let's, let's think about that for a second, okay? They're going to do a documentary on what it means to be young and white. And this documentary is going to be hosted by an illegal immigrant. So their trailer says that many white people feel uncomfortable talking about race. You say the wrong thing, then suddenly you're a racist, one young man says. Let's get uncomfortable, the trailer says. This documentary, which is set to air on July 22nd, is being hosted by Jose Antonio Vargas. He is an illegal immigrant and a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who was raised in the Philippines. Now, Mr. Vargas and I have had a not so friendly exchange on Twitter before um, where he touted his Pulitzer as his qualification for deserving to be an American. To which I say, Bullshit. The only people that deserve to be Americans are naturally born Americans and immigrants who legally, not illegally, but legally process through the immigration and customs process and earn their citizenship the legal way as prescribed by United States law. Now, Jose, you can piss off back to the Philippines. You can take your MTV documentary and you can shove it up your illegal ass. But according to MTV network executives, the show is designed to challenge whiteness and help address racial bias through honest, judgment-free dialogue. MTV president Stephen Friedman said, whiteness often remains unexamined in conversations about race in this country, even as it acts as the implicit norm against which other racial identities are judged. By shining a spotlight on whiteness, we hope white people will serve as a powerful conversation starter that encourages our audience to address racial bias through honest, judgment-free dialogue. If I bring up any sort of race issue with my parents, they immediately think I'm demonizing them, one young woman says in a trailer. How might your life be different if you weren't white, asked the host. Well, let me tell you something, Jose who, let me tell you something. The trailer goes on to say, in a documentary that will change the way you think about white history, white frustration, and white privilege. Some who have viewed the trailer on YouTube say it's a way of shaming white people. But Vargas says that's just not the case. According to Vargas, white people is not publicly shaming whites. That's not the goal. The goal is to spark constructive conversations. And he even tweeted, and I screen captured his tweet, and he says exactly that. This is, this is something that was drummed up in the boardroom that he and their spokespeople are just rapidly pushing out to the press. And I'll say it again, white people is not publicly shaming whites. That's not the goal. The goal is to spark constructive conversations. 
Jose Antonio Vargas. You wouldn't realize a constructive conversation about race if it bit your ass. Now, I am going to reach out to Jose Antonio Vargas and invite him on to the show. I don't expect that he will accept. Uh, we are not necessarily on uh, friendly terms. So I'm willing to give him a fair shake and explain his position uh, after I get a chance to view this quote unquote documentary that I'm sure was just chock full of hand selected apologists to participate. MTV has reached a new low. A new low. They have stooped to Obama's level and are race baiting. Disgusting. But we'll see what happens. Now, on to something that's been irking me for a week or two. The president's radio address was a continuation of a recent Supreme Court decision about housing. Obama said in his radio address, if you want a bus stop added near your home or more affordable housing nearby, now you'll have the data you need to make your case. He was talking about the way his administration is interpreting the Fair Housing Act, an interpretation approved last month like every other damn thing, by the United States Supreme Court. The law explicitly bars intentional discrimination. And the Obama administration says the law also requires housing and urban development to actively promote, quote unquote, fair housing, even where there is no intentional discrimination. Disparate impact must, I repeat, must be taken into account. The Department of Housing and Urban Development on July 8 issued a final rule intended to move poor people, quote unquote, into communities that are rich with opportunity, according to Secretary. Julian Castro. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with what that means, let's dig a little deeper, okay? Because this issue is going to piss off some folks. To help local governments identify patterns of racial and ethnic discrimination, housing and urban development will issue maps, charts, and other data graphs showing racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, the location of subsidized housing, and where wealthier people have access to opportunity based on key community assets, such as good schools and job opportunities. If communities want to continue receiving federal housing funds, they must spend the money in ways that move inner city minorities into subsidized housing in wealthier, whiter suburbs. Okay, are you getting this? So, did you recently drop 400 grand for your house in a sprawling new subdivision? Well, guess what? Now, housing and urban development is going to start spending money to build housing next to you so that people that haven't earned the money to purchase housing along your lines gets housing along your lines. And that those people that you put security systems on your house to guard from, whether they're white, black, brown, red, 
purple, green, blue, or plaid. I don't care. Criminals come in all shapes, colors, sexes, religions, creeds, you name it. They're out there. Okay? But the people that you lock your house up to protect it from, they want to move in next door to you. Now, that's not all of them. That is not all of them. There are good poor people. <laughs> Hell, I grew up as one. I know. But just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court ruled that policies segregating minorities in poor neighborhoods, even unintentionally, are against the law. So what I'm wondering is, what is housing and urban development going to do? Are they actually going to build houses in subdivisions and award them to people? Obviously, they can't just come in and take 50 lots away from a developer. So, again, what the hell are they going to do? Are they going to imminent domain subdivisions at different socioeconomic levels and evict people from their homes so that they can move poorer people into the neighborhood? What that achieves is creating more inner city slums in the suburbs. You know, show me somebody, show me somebody that lives in a slum through whatever difficulties they have managed to keep their home clean, serviceable, their lawn kept, you know, basic pride in your home. Show me those people. Those are the people who I wouldn't mind moving in next to me. Show me the people like the ones I saw a few weeks ago that had their windows open in their house and their dogs and children were playing chase, running from one end of the house, jumping out of a window, running across the front yard and jumping in another window, making a giant circle. While there were six broken down lawnmowers, about 70 pounds of scattered trash, three cars sitting on blocks, two with no wheels, and oil stains from these leaky cars all over the grass and dirt in their yard. Those are not the people I want living next to me in my subdivision. I don't care what color they are. And if that's my quote-unquote whiteness coming out, then the brown and red in me is going to have to just rear its ugly head and deal with it. The president noted, though, that children living just a few blocks apart may lead incredibly different lives. Hey, guess what, Mr. President? Children living next door to each other oftentimes lead incredibly different lives. It comes from having parents that give a damn about them. But blocks apart, they may go to different schools. Yes, that's true. They may play in different parks. Yes, that is also true. They may shop at different stores and walk down different streets. You think they might walk down different streets, Mr. President? Those are your words. Do you think people that live a few blocks away from each other might walk down different streets? What an ass. And often the quality of those schools and the safety of those parks and streets are far from equal, he says. Why is that? Why is that? I'll tell you why that is. That's the culture that exists on those streets. It has nothing to do with anybody's skin color. Mr. Obama says that runs against the values we hold dear as Americans. No, it doesn't. It doesn't run against our values.
President Obama could have used his own daughters as examples. You know, they do attend an elite private school in Washington in a city where many poor blacks struggle in failing public schools. Why didn't he do that? In this country, of all countries, a person's zip code shouldn't decide their destiny, said Obama in his radio address. We don't guarantee equal outcomes, but we do strive to guarantee an equal shot at opportunity in every neighborhood for every American. And you know what, Mr. President? Your words are true, but that's not what you're practicing. Every person in every neighborhood has the same opportunity. They have the opportunity to go to a public school and to get educated and to use that education to develop a career, whether they go to college after that education or whether they go to the workforce directly from that education. That is their choice. That is their right. Engineering society does not work. Now, Obama says the Fair Housing Act also says that this isn't the responsibility of a landlord alone. Local governments have a role to play, too. That's why this week his administration announced that they will make it easier for communities to implement this law. He goes on to say, we're using data on housing and neighborhood conditions to help cities identify the areas that need the most help. They need help. Yeah, okay. They need help because they're too upper middle class. They're too lower upper class. They're too west side. They're too Manhattan. And they need help. He says we're doing more to help communities meet their own goals. Plus, by opening this data to everybody, everyone in a community, not just elected officials, can weigh in. And then he goes on to his ridiculous bus stop or affordable housing comment. He said these actions won't make every community perfect, but that's something we all have to strive for in our own lives but they will help make our community stronger and more vibrant. Uh, if vibrant is the uh, Washington, D.C. easy speak for crime-ridden, then yeah, he's right. Oh, and they'll be able to keep, uh, they'll keep this a country where kids from every background can grow up knowing that no matter who you are, or what you look like, or where you live, or who you love, you can write your own story. And that's the America I love, and it's the America I'll keep fighting for, concluded President Obama. People, this man is off his rocker. He intends to use his last year plus in office to socially re-engineer this country. He's got the Supreme Court behind him. He's got Congress knuckling down to him. It's up to us. We have to stop him. I'm sick of it. So in this new role as the uh, <laughs> central planner, we'll call it, HUD's going to review these locally determined priorities and goals, using federal funding as the means to achieve its will. If communities want... Uh, sorry, Mr. Producer. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Producer said, I heard the earlobe smacking that. Uh, no, I didn't break anything, uh, luckily. But if communities want to keep receiving federal housing funds, Mr. Castro says they must spend the money in ways 
that more inner city minorities are moved into subsidized housing in wealthier, whiter suburbs. And now get this comment, okay? One of the biggest bold faced self-admitted communists in this country are the Castro brothers. And I'm not talking about Fidel and Raul. I'm talking about Julian and his brother. Julian says, as a former mayor, I know firsthand that strong communities are vital to the well-being and prosperity of families. That means, okay, that means if they put enough criminal element into your upper crust neighborhood, that they'll be able to steal enough that everybody can be prosperous. These were Castro's comments in the final rule that was announced on Wednesday. Now, folks, we're getting short on time here. I can't stress enough the need for you to do your research. You have got to dig into these topics. You have got to learn how your government is screwing you over, how they are breaking the laws by reinterpreting the laws, whether it's the Supreme Court, whether it's Obama's administration, whether it's the Republican Party that's in charge of the Senate and the House, or whether it's the minority Democrats in the Senate and the House. Our federal government is broken. They don't care about the Constitution anymore. And oh, there was a great article on Town Hall by Kurt Schlitter. Colonel Schlitter is a genius. And he was talking about how the Republicans need to just throw their hands in the air, abandon the old rules and their quote-unquote higher moral ground, and start playing by the rules that the progressives and the communists and the liberals and the Democrats have set forth as the new rules. Let's play by their rules and see how they like it. Ah, Kurt, if you're out there, one night we need to have you on. Um, folks, tomorrow night on K98 Talk, the rowdy one, Rick Robinson, with America Off the Rails, will be doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with Mr. John Sununu. You won't want to miss it. I guarantee you it is going to catch fire. This is going to be good stuff. Then Rowdy Rick is also sitting in on the big enchilada on Thursday nights on K98 Talk, and that is Red Nation Rising. That's right, Red Nation Rising, Thursday nights on K98 Talk. Now, we got to spin back around and we got to promote the rest of the group too as we wind down the show tonight. Uh, I, I went through my material a little quick, so we've got a few minutes to kill here. So, Mr. Producer, if you're out there, feel free to dive in and start helping me. I'm here. What's up? Okay, good. Uh, Monday Night Lineup on K98, we have Politatainment and Politatainment. Is that correct? We have myself at uh, 7 Eastern. Then we have an open spot currently that will likely be filled here pretty quickly. And then we have at 8 o'clock... The uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, real serious nonsense with Angie and Pole, and then nine o'clock, of course, all time central because I'm stuck there, guys. Um, right. Then we Staff have uh, the Stafford Voice with Daniel Stafford. Yes. Okay. And then Tuesday night uh, we kick off with you. You're Monday through Friday again. Yep. Everybody needs to know that um, Monday through Friday, America off the rails. Um. And Tuesday night is Leslie and Bill with the right angle. Actually, we, we, just signed, we just signed a new show, so I'll be making an announcement about that over the next okay. few days. They will probably be taking in the 7 o'clock Central 8 Eastern time slot. Then we have uh, the right angle with Leslie and Bill, and then we round out Tuesday nights with the first edition of Game On with J.D. and Stacy. Very good, very good. And Wednesday, of course, is the trifecta. That would be America Off the Rails, followed by yours truly, 
followed by Jason DeWilkins with According to Me. So that, that there you go. True. And do we have a Friday lineup yet? Uh, we do have two shows that are currently running on Fridays. They are not first runs for us. It's kind of starting like the bunny situation. We have Behind Enemy Lines, and then we also have the Vito and Vito show. Vito and Vito. Very good. Very good. I, I was unaware that we had Vito on the air with Vito. And that's not to be mistaken with what the president does to a bill he doesn't like. That's Vito, V-I-T-O, not Vito, V-E-T-O. So um, keep that in mind. Those guys are great. You really need to tune in and listen. And, folks, as uh, as we wrap it up tonight, um, you know, again, I have to encourage you, do your homework. Use your brain. Make informed decisions and hold your elected representatives accountable. And with that, I will bid you adieu and tell you to stay tuned for Jason DeWilkins with According to Me. Jason packs a two-hour show into 60 minutes every week just for you. And he's going to do it again tonight. So be cool. And we'll see you in a week. Go ahead. Ain't that America? Something to see, baby. Ain't that